As has already been announced, the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State for Scotland have decided to appoint a committee under the chairmanship of Mr J F Wolfenden, CBE, Vice-Chancellor of Reading University, to consider a. The law and practice relating to homosexual offences and treatment of persons convicted of such offences by the courts and b. The law and practice relating to offences against the criminal law in connection with prostitution and solicitation for immoral purposes and to report what changes, if any, are in their opinion desirable. The other members of committee are as follows. Mr James Adair, OBE, Mrs A.M. Cohen, Dr Desmond Curran, Reverend Canon V.A. DeMont, Mr Kenneth Diplock, QC, Sir Hugh Linstead, OBE, MP, the Marquess of Lothian, In 1957, Sir John Wolfenden concluded his highly anticipated report of the Committee on Homosexual Offences and Prostitution and presented it to the then Home Secretary, Rab Butler MP. This contentious document became known as the Wolfenden Report, which took three years of deliberation and debate before a conclusion was made. Welcome to the National Archives. I'm Vicky Glukowski and I am the Diverse Histories Record Specialist here. So I focus a lot on women and gender history, LGBT history um, and other kind of traditionally marginalised or hidden histories. There's a huge, uh, vast amount of uh, records here um, and within that we have a lot of LGBT history where people have interacted with the state in the past, um, including records relating to the Wolfenden Report and Committee and the Sexual Offences Act of 1967. The announcement of the report followed the trials of a number of prominent, well-respected men in the public sphere who were caught by police engaging in sexual acts with other men. Amongst the punishments handed out were heavy fines and prison sentences, in some cases, life. The outcome of the report was very kind of controversial for the time, really, and progressive, because essentially the report is very well known for recommending partial decriminalisation of homosexual acts. It was a limited uh, recommendation. It recommended that this was the case in private, it only applied to England and Wales, the recommendations. Essentially, this was a starting point for kind of a movement towards greater equality for LGBT people. So, hear how it has been for me in the last 60 years. Certainly at age 17, I knew I was attracted to the same sex. I tried to suppress my feelings towards the same sex, with bearing in mind my mother and my father were always hinting and asking, when was I going to bring that girl home? I felt I was going to hide my feelings by going to cinema and dance sessions with girls, pretending to date them. And one in particular who, though wedding bells were just around the corner for us, I had to tell her, to be fair, I was no longer interested in her. I know this almost broke both of our hearts, and I felt awful in telling her, but not able then to say the real reason why. It caused much misery to me and a feeling of isolation, because all around me at work, etc., I heard the word Nancy Boy, queer, bent as a ten bob note, etc., banded about by ignorant people aimed at anyone who didn't seem to fit the norm of heterosexuality. I had a growing feeling that I was to leave my home surroundings, and strangely enough, set off with a straight mate of mine for the London direction. Because I had strong feelings that I needed to associate with other gay men, I left the lodgings we both lived at for another part of town. And though he had been a best mate of mine from home, in order for me to set up this new life, I more or less left severing the matey ties with him. And I really feel guilty to this day in doing so, but felt I had to do so because he was also a friend of my parents. Afterwards setting up on my own, I met a gay man, but because at the time before the bill, I felt, I felt nervous and unclean about it, so I severed ties with him, which made me feel so isolated. I decided because I went home to visit my parents at the time, I would devote my life to my career. After some time with my desires being to meet gay men for companionship, I moved to another city. I heard of a pub in the area where I overheard people at work saying, you don't want to go there because that's where all the queers go. One evening I thought this is where I must go. I walked past the door many times, looking both ways in the street, and then dived in the door hoping that no one had seen me. After ordering a drink at the bar, I felt a tap on my shoulder. My legs turned to jelly, wondering who it would be. 
To my relief, it was another, another man who I worked with saying, Fancy seeing you in here. I felt a big black cloud had been removed from above me. I thought, isn't it terrible that you have to meet another gay person you work with in a way such as this? He held secret gay meetings at his place, which was a relief to me, to meet other gay people and feel relief to speak openly about gay life. It was a welcome turning point for me, and after the bill came about, I went on to share a happy, loving relationship with my partner, until he died recently, for over 23 years. Prior to 1967, it was forbidden in UK law for two men to engage in any form of sexual intimacy, even in private. This caused men who engage in homosexual activities to seek clandestine meetings in secret, often run-down places, always knowing that if they were caught, the shame and punishment that would follow them would damage their lives and reputations forever. So, as the chairman, Wolfenden asks, is there anything you want to add to, uh, to what you've already told us? to what has come out of this, because we should be very grateful for it if you have anything to add. Peter Wildblood then responds, Yes, I do not know if I have stressed enough the point that the principal reason why I feel the law is wrong is that it makes life extremely difficult, almost impossible, for a very large number of men, and I do not know how large they are, who in all other respects are perfectly good citizens. There is no doubt about it, once you fall foul of the law in one respect, it is very difficult to behave as a proper citizen in other respects as well. It is a tremendous strain for anybody and of course it would it is of course also it is unjust because it falls on the people who would be leading completely content lives as well as people who are not. And even though they must never be prosecuted, there is always a fear of it. The selected committee comprised of mostly gentlemen, but some ladies, all from wealthy educated backgrounds. Amongst the 200 testimonies taken, only three of those belonged to homosexual men. An interesting fact about the committee was that words homosexual and prostitute were considered too offensive for the delicate ears of the lady stenographers. It was decided to change these ill-perceived words and refer to homosexuals as Huntleys and prostitutes as Palmers, after the famous biscuit factory based in Reading. For as long as I can remember, I knew that when I was older I would marry a man and have children with him. It didn't really matter what job I did or my achievements because society told me that my greatest and most worthwhile achievement would be marrying the man of my dreams and becoming a mother. It has only been over the past few years that I realised how messed up that was. However, this innate belief that being with a man would make me fulfilled and truly happy led to years of feeling isolated and repressing my emotions in order to conform. Indications that I loved girls and then women started young, but heteronormativity blinded me to them. I would watch Disney's Hercules and feel all warm and fuzzy looking at Meg. I would secretly pair female characters together in TV shows and movies. When I started to go clubbing, I would dance with boys and make out, despite finding the making out part disgusting. I'd convinced myself that if I found the right boy, man, I would like kissing them. I distinctly remember crying to my mum, age 20, and asking her, what's wrong with me? Because everyone around me was in heterosexual relationships and, try as hard as I could, I didn't fancy men. Despite now recognising that I am gay, I still struggle, struggle with accepting myself. Friends and some family have been so positive, but there are still times when I can't accept myself. Whether it's watching a romantic comedy of a boy meets girl, attending the wedding of a straight friend, or seeing constant advertising featuring heterosexual couples, I find my sexuality is not only absent, but a maker of my difference. Try as I might, I can't conform to heterosexuality, and I shouldn't feel the need to. However, with the increasing visibility of LGBT plus role models across media forms and knowing more LGBT plus individuals personally, I am hopeful that in time, heteronormativity will become less pervasive. An LGBT individual struggling to come to terms with their sexuality and gender won't feel less than. At the time, the attitudes towards homosexuality were extremely negative and homosexual men were even described as a cancer in modern society. 
There were anxieties that if this cancer was not treated, it would undermine the legal and moral principles of heterosexuality. For months, Wolfenden wrestled with the extremities of the responses he received from the witnesses who came before him. Jeremy, Wolfenden's son, was homosexual, so it is understandable why Wolfenden felt he had to tread his path very carefully. I am queer, so much is physically evident, but I have a lot more important things to do than waste my time hunting young men. I may end up with an undemanding and unsensational menage with a single boyfriend. I may end up unsatisfied, except for an occasional Sloan Street tart. I may, I suppose, turn to heterosexuality, but if by a pretty mature 18, I am not attracted by girls, either physically or emotionally, or aesthetically, it seems unlikely. With that in mind, the committee agreed that morality and criminality should be kept separate in law, and that homosexuality, whilst morally unacceptable to many, should not be a criminal offence. The finished report was long and exhaustive. All members of the committee accepted its findings, with the exception of one, Mr James Adair, a former Procurator General in Glasgow. The committee eventually reached the conclusion that whilst the law should exist to prevent exploitation and abuse, and must continue to protect the young and other vulnerable individuals, it should not intrude into matters of personal morality. The Wolfenden report drew many comparisons between homosexual acts and heterosexual ones. This led them to conclude that if an act would be illegal for heterosexuals, it should be also illegal for homosexuals, though it did recommend a higher age of consent for men. It also recognised an important argument which was felt to be decisive in the treatment of homosexuals by the law. Namely, the importance which society and the law ought to give to individual freedom of choice and matters of private morality. The committee stated that there must remain a realm of private morality and immorality that is, in brief and crude terms, not the law's business. We accordingly recommend that homosexual behaviour between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offence. That said, it was agreed that a conspiracy to commit or assist homosexual acts should remain a criminal offence. Wolfenden's report went before the cabinet, but the recommendations on homosexuality weren't embraced. In the House of Lords in 1965, Conservative peer Lord Aran proposed a motion in favour of implementing the recommendations of the Wolfenden report. The following year, Labour peer Leo Absey sponsored a sexual offences bill. The Labour cabinet refrained from taking sides and allowed a free vote, and so the Sexual Offences Act of 1967 came into being. It's important to note that Leo Absey's act did not legalise gay sex, it just partially decriminalised it. The act cemented into law a number of inequalities that would take decades to rectify. For example, the age of consent for men who had sex with men was set at 21, whereas for heterosexual people it was 16. There were also exclusions for the armed forces and merchant seamen. The ban on armed forces was informally lifted in 2000, though the law was not repealed until the Armed Forces Act of 2016. The Act did not cover Scotland, Northern Ireland, the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, and there was an incredibly narrow, confusing definition of the term in private when referring to sexual acts. The Campaign for Homosexual Equality, Gay Liberation Front and Lesbian and Gay Christian Movement were some of the earliest pressure groups founded to bring about social acceptance of LGBTQ plus people. Activities of all these pressure groups involve campaigning against discrimination within medical, psychiatric and social services and pressing for more law reform in regards to age of consent, among other things. My, actually, my father showed me something that was in the Daily Mirror. I'm not quite sure why he had the Daily Mirror, because he read the Daily Worker, but anyhow, there was, this, there was a, something about GLF in the Daily Mirror, and he showed it to us, my friend was who was staying with us, and, um, and he said it might be interesting to go along to GLF. And I thought that might be interesting, yeah. And eventually we, we found it and, um, and went in and... All these people who we knew they were all gay and there was something really, very, very exciting about it. The first Gay Pride March in the UK took place on 1st of July 1972, with almost 2,000 people participating in the protests. 
And people sometimes ask, were you very frightened? First Pride March in London, in 1st of July, 1972. And the answer is that I wasn't, because it was arranged by the youth group in Gay Liberation Front. And they were under 25s because the law then still said that in the case of gay men, they were not allowed sex under 21. And they invented the Pride March. So they weren't in the least afraid to go on it. It was their idea. Okay. And us who were older, I was about 30 then, we weren't afraid to go on it if we'd been taking part in Gay Liberation Front for six months. It started in October 1970. And so it had been going for, oh, longer than six months, hadn't it? Because we're talking of July the 1st, 1972. So it had been going for a couple of years. And we'd been in, involved in so many demos and We'd been, uh, some of us had been arrested occasionally by the police. And we were always equipped with the names of friendly solicitors who would turn up at the cop shop uh, if we used our one telephone call to say something's gone wrong for somebody else or for ourselves. No, we were exhilarated. We were entertained. We were having a, a wonderful time. In 1976, 20 years after the report was published, Wolfenden, in his memoir, Turning Point, urged for the reform on laws regarding homosexuality, especially the reduction of the age of consent. The 1980s could be considered as a setback for the LGBTQ plus people. One of the biggest moments in the 80s was Section 28. It was legislation introduced by Margaret Thatcher's government prohibiting local authorities from promoting or publishing material with the intention of promoting homosexuality. Sex education itself had only been introduced into the curriculum in the 60s, so there was definitely a drive to reaffirming heteronormative relationships. Darren, why do you hate queers? I knew it was a stupid question as I uttered it. Well, they're disgusting, and what they do is disgusting, and, and... I stopped Darren his tracks. Do you know any homosexuals personally? Darren gagged. God, no, they make me puke. I would kill them. Wobbly sniggers hovered in the air. They knew my lack of tolerance for that infantile macho bravado. Well, one in ten of us are queer, according to statistics. So in this class, you know at least two, personally. Derisory laughs rolled around the classroom. What my voice set failed to say was, and I am one of them. And you have managed to work without aggro for me for two terms now. I wanted to ask, are you afraid of that? Are you afraid that you are gay? More homophobic declarations flew around the room until the bell helped me put the end, an end to it all. When the bell went, my lumbering boys could fought their way out of the room. Daryl hung back. Miss, she said, have you read World of Loneliness? Yes, I have, and what a miserable novel that is. But I can recommend other books that are much more fun. Would you like that? Daryl nodded imperceptibly and left the room. Sob section 28, I thought. The 90s saw many milestones in the LGBTQ plus rights movement. Same-sex attraction was no longer considered a mental health issue, and Tony Blair's Labour government made it possible for same-sex partners to apply for their foreign partner to remain in the UK, if they had lived together for four years. This period also paved way for Trans Day of Remembrance to commemorate and mourn the victims of trans hate crimes. The new millennium saw a big shift in the rights for LGBTQ plus people, especially when Section 28 was repealed. The Sexual Offences Act of 2003 meant that the age of consent was reduced to 16 for everyone, regardless of gender or sexual orientation. Marriage equality was finally achieved in 2013 for same-sex couples, after civil unions were introduced previously. The Equality Act of 2010 sought to improve the quality of life and accessibility to government-funded services for all people, regardless of age, disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. An amendment in the Policing and Crime Act of 2017 has granted amnesty and pardon for crimes of gross indecency between men for those who died after being imprisoned for their homosexuality.
We still have a long way to go in the progression of LGBTQ plus rights, even after all the amazing things that have been achieved in the last 60 years. It just comes to show that when people come together to stand up for each other's rights, change can be made. I feel very comfortable. I feel proud to be who I am and to educate people. Lesbian is not an insult. It's what I am. I'm not ashamed. I'm proud to be me. Being out is freedom. It is being who you want to be, no matter who tries to shout you down. Have you heard on a bus in Reading on Reading Pride Day? X is no longer on Snapchat. Oh, yeah, they are. They've just changed their name to Z. They are uh, transgender now. Oh, OK. Hiding away just because they don't know what to say to you. I know you Find all the flaws and their outdated laws I know you They'll never be done till they all understand I know you Always fight hard for the ones who are scarred Before you And the So deep as the cost is so steep, I feel you. 